for the introduction, Bernadette. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm a neurologist working in the Amsterdam UMC, um, and my key interests are uh, treating patients with movement disorders and um, uh, neuromodulation. Um, and um, I would like to um, emphasize a little bit on the title. So as um, neuroscientists, um, we can make use of the fantastic data we can obtain from DBS recordings. And I call this the subcortical periscope. So by uh, treating patients with, uh, with DBS, uh, we can also uh, record neural activity and see whether that activity can help in optimizing the treatment of, uh, of DBS in, in patients. And um, since, um, yeah, since, since last year, um, there uh, has been a, a, a huge development in the hardware industry of DBS devices, which makes it possible to record for longer periods in patients and um, to start thinking about new stimulation algorithms so uh, that will be the topic of my talk. Um, there will be some overlap with the introductory slides of, of Bernadette, but um, <coughs> that, uh, that will help in understanding why, uh, why we do uh, what we do. Um, so DBS is an uh, established and impactful treatment, uh, especially in movement disorders. Um, in Amsterdam, we especially treat patients with uh, Parkinson's disease, tremor and dystonia. But next to that, um, there's also uh, a large uh, cohort of patients with OCD that's treated in a care as usual setting. Next to that, um, uh, patients with epilepsy are frequently treated in the, in the Netherlands and other indications uh, are coming. Well, um, I summarized the, the key challenges of the fields um, in three topics. That's the selection of the optimal anatomical target at patient level and to find the optimal stimulation parameters and the adjustment of the stim uh, stimulation to the situation of the patient uh, at a certain moment uh, throughout the day, but also in his or her disease. So you can summarize that in optimizing where, how, and when to stimulate with the deep brain stimulation. Um, I'll um, start with the where issue. Uh, we know from our own center that it's very important to, to stimulate the, the motor part of the subthalamic nucleus in patients with, with Parkinson's disease. And uh, we even uh, found uh, correlation um, with the distance to this, uh, this spot with regards um, to uh, the medial STN border. Um, <clears throat> but it's still quite difficult to, to come to that target due to the limitation of um, current imaging strategies. And for that reason, new MR sequences are developed. And more and more, we are also use uh, tractography to, to look at individual tracks and to see how certain symptoms can be treated better uh, with localizing the electrodes in, uh, in white matter tracks. Um, <clears throat> the, the second part uh, is about how we stimulate. Um, currently, the, the stimulation parameter optimization uh, typically starts a few weeks after the, the implantation of the DBS leads, um, where after the patient comes to the outpatient clinic and we do a screening, as we call it, of all the contact points and look at which of the contact points or combination of contact points the stimulation is more most efficacious and leads to the least side effects. Well, we have um, several um, aspects of the pulses we, we provide. So we can change the currents. They typically um, are between say uh, one and four milliamps uh, or volts in, um, in, in the STN in PD, but can change with other indications. And we have different pulse widths we can give. We can stimulate with different frequencies. Um, and we can stimulate with uh, multiple montages. Um, so we can uh, stimulate in a monopolar way, in a double monopolar way, <laughs> in a bipolar way. So um, you can easily think that you uh, calculate that you come to more than 10,000 of combinations of stimulation parameters. And um, at present, there's no evidence-based stimulation um, approach for, for optimizing those, those stimulation parameters. 
And several studies show that when you start reprogramming um, patients, when they're in a different state of their disease, um, the effect of a PBS can improve. But you can imagine that it's very laborious and fatiguing for patients to, uh, to come to the optimal stimulation settings. So you can think that if there are proxies or physio markers, as they are coined recently, that help us in optimizing the, the spread of the current, um, that this, uh, this uh, optimization process um, can be improved and patients can uh, have a better uh, effect of DBS with less side effects. Next to that, <coughs> it turns out that it's also important um, when we stimulate. This is a very um, interesting uh, paper from the, from the Oxford group, now 15 years uh, old. And um, it shows that uh, the effect of DBS um, doesn't improve the, the motor velocity um, in, uh, in every uh, situation. So when Parkinsonian patients um, are tapping really fast uh, without having stimulation, they actually deteriorate while DBS is switched uh, on and vice versa. So this, um, this shows that um, that the brain stimulation might not only um, disrupt pathological uh, neurophysiological activity, but might um, also disrupt physiological neural activity. And for that reason, um, we're constantly thinking about when we should stimulate and how that relates to the, the cycles of patients throughout the day and uh, in their dopaminergic status. So if we look at this study, we see that um, the Parkinsonian symptoms are really volatile over the day. And with DBS, we aim to, um, uh, to decrease this volatility and get patients on a more constant uh, on situation. However, it turns out that there are still fluctuations over the day and that not every symptom reacts uh, as well to medication um, as to the brain stimulation and uh, that the effect of, of stimulation um, changes throughout the day, week, and uh, disease course, um, which is um, yeah, uh, also uh, more outspoken in the more pronounced uh, disease stages. Um, this is a more hypothetical example of how um, DBS might um, disrupt the, uh, the behavior of uh, populations of neurons that we can record with local field potentials. And the key idea behind this is that uh, there is an amount of optimal synchrony between these um, populations of neurons and there, um, uh, there is a situation in which, which there's too much and too little synchrony. And that's the conceptual idea behind um, more adaptive forms of DBS that are able to titrate the amount of stimulation based on the actual amount of uh, pathological oscillations. Um, here, um, I wanted to show you a very well-known um, electrophysiological phenomenon that has a very um, remarkable motor exponent, and that's the, the EKG. So we, uh, we know that uh, there's a, a clear correlation between the P, QRS, and T wave in the EKG. And you know what is going to move when you see a certain um, electrophysiological um, change. With movement disorders, that's more difficult. Um, you can imagine that if there's a patient with tremor, um, you can record that with accelerometers, and uh, you know when the tremor um, is present or not. Uh, based on a quite uh, straightforward signal. Um, with Parkinson's disease and dystonia, this is getting more difficult. So there's a growing interest in quantifying um, the severity of, say, bradykinesia, dyskinesia, and, and rigidity, um, as well as actual symptoms, but it's still difficult to grasp that instantaneously and use that as a feedback parameter for the brain stimulation. So um, for that reason, uh, we're looking at uh, different sites uh, to objectify the severity of, of certain symptoms. Um, so we can um, look at myography. Uh, we can look at um, 
LFPs um, from the subcortical nuclei, but also from ECOG signals, um, so electrocortical graphite, which uh, makes it possible to, uh, to look uh, simultaneously at cortical and subcortical activity and their mutual relation. Um, well, these are the three examples that, that show um, um, what uh, the, the role of beta oscillations is in Parkinson's disease. In fact, these are the three uh, examples uh, Bernadette also named, but from um, um, three different data points or two different data points, I should say. Um, so we know that um, the amount of, of beta oscillations decreases after dopaminergic um, stimulation is, provi uh, 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 is provided. So via medication, but also when DDS is switched on or off. And uh, what we also know and increasingly recognize is that the amount of beta oscillations is correlated with the severity of bradykinesia and akinesia, but not with the severity of tremor, which is very important uh, because the different symptoms can um, have different effects on the quality of life in different patients. So, it might be that there's no thing as a one size fits all physiomarker for Parkinson's disease, and that these physiomarkers should be um, tailored to the uh, symptoms of a certain patient. Um, <clears throat> here, um, uh, I want to show you that um, there are um, differences in this oscillatory profile between diseases. Um, so it's difficult to, yeah, to have control uh, subjects, of course, for, for these invasive recordings. And um, there are no good animal models for, um, for dystonia, for example. So uh, when you compare um, the oscillatory activity in the GPI uh, in patients with dystonia and Parkinson's disease, you see uh, a difference in the low frequency range where more oscillations are present in dystonia and in the previously mentioned beta range um, in Parkinson's disease. And it's also the case that this beta activity resonates uh, throughout the basal ganglia. And there's an equal amount of beta oscillations in the GP as in the STM. Um, we, uh, we looked at that uh, in, in different studies to, to see uh, whether, there are, uh, uh, whether there are comparisons between Parkinson's disease and dystonia uh, to, to show uh, how disease specific this, this beta um, um, increase is. Um, and we showed that um, in uh, the GP, the STN and in the primary motor cortex, this uh, increased beta activity is, is present. And that's also in line with uh, recordings from, from DBS electrodes and uh, MAC electrodes that show that the coherence between uh, those two structures um, are especially in the beta bands and they are uh, influenced by, uh, by DBS, which uh, might explain um, why there is a clinical effect for especially radiokinesia and rigidity. Um, so it's not only the, the power spectral density over a longer uh, period in the, in the beta band, it also seems to be the case that there's um, a pattern in the increased beta oscillations. And the more longer um, bursts of, of increased beta activations are present, the more severe um, the bradykinesia and rigidity are, and vice versa. So it's might you might explain it that these longer beta bursts kidnap the uh, the possibility to uh, um, to convey um, physiological uh, activity. So this this longer burst duration is in the magnitude of um, uh, 500 to to 1200 seconds, and the shorter bursts are, are shorter than 500 milliseconds. This is a totally different time range than the, the fluctuations you see uh, when medication is, uh, is wearing off. Um, so when we want to make use um, of these fluctuations um, and want to see how we can titrate the therapy in a more intelligent way, um, 
we uh, yeah we're, we're exploring whether feedback mechanisms can be applied in uh, applying uh, DBS in cardiology. Um, these feedback mechanisms are uh, incorporated in defibrillators for, for more than 40 years, but the signal magnitude is, is much lower um, for, um, for DBS, so which makes it more challenging and more invasive to, to optimize those, um, those strategies, as well as to, to optimize the feedback parameters based on the symptoms of, of individual patients. But by doing that, we, yeah, we can speak of a very simple uh, brain-computer interface in which we um, yeah, interfere in a systematic way uh, with, with unpredicted patterns uh, because the, the, the signals of the patient itself uh, predict uh, how the stimulation will behave. If we look at the most simple ADDS paradigms, this is an example of how this uh, is done in practice. Um, if you look at the middle uh, channel, um, you see the, uh, the LFP and the beta bands. You see that there are moments when there's uh, exaggerated beta activity, and you see moments when there's very low beta activity. And when averaging that over 400 millisecond um, uh, epochs, we see that uh, a certain threshold is exceeded and that stimulation is uh, switched on at those, um, those moments. So this is an um, uh, example of a unilateral um, stimulation algorithm. This um, is a similar approach in a, in a bilateral way. And uh, what you see here is that it's possible to, to stimulate in a monopolar way and that you use the, um, the uh, bipolar LFP from the two uh, adjacent uh, contact points as um, uh, as feedback parameter. So um, the, uh, the site of stimulation differs from the site where you get your um, LFP, um, but uh, it might be that that average out, but that's uh, an ongoing issue of where to stimulate and where to sense. Maybe you can sense at totally different sites, but that's a work in progress. Um, if we look at uh, the clinical effects of, um, of applying ADBS in, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we know that um, there, um, there is a modest effect on the whole UPDRS uh, subscore, including bradykinesia and tremor, which is comparable with uh, continuous uh, conventional DBS. Um, and there's a slight bigger improvement um, in comparing uh, adaptive stimulation uh, with, um, with no stimulation with regard to um, uh, bradykinesia and rigidity. And this seems not to be the case for, uh, for tremor, which might not be related to the, the beta activity. And uh, we also see a, a tendency towards a favorable effects on, on side effects, especially the stimulation-induced dysartria. Well, in the last decade, um, quite a few studies have come up to, um, to discuss the uh, potential of adaptive stimulation um, strategies in, in Parkinson's disease. And um, despite the interest in literature as shown by Habits et al., there are um, still few studies that manage to actually apply uh, adaptive DBS in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, and up to now, um, yeah, only 61, maybe a few more um, patients are reported in the literature. Well, is this um, an evidence that um, the, uh, the treatment is not going to make its way to clinical practice or is it going to take a longer time to get there? I think one um, important aspect up to now um, is that uh, virtually most uh, studies reporting on adaptive DBS have been performed in so-called externalized uh, recordings, most often uh, immediately after the implementation of, of DBS leads, which makes it um, challenging to, uh, to record the, the signals. Often there's a so-called stun effect and recordings can be, uh, be short only. Uh, there's a challenging test environment. It's, not too comfortable for the patients to um, uh, to stay longer in the OR or to get uh, involved in research in the immediate uh, post-operative phase. 
and um, the possibilities of, of conducting research are, are limited uh, with these externalized uh, recordings. Um, last year has been um, an exciting year because at least uh, three manufacturers uh, came up with uh, new um, hardware that makes it possible to, um, to record uh, neural activity uh, during stimulation. So that, that makes it possible to, to look at the influence of stimulation on, on certain uh, oscillatory patterns. But next to that, um, it opens up the way to clinically um, investigate and eventually uh, apply adaptive stimulation. So um, this is a paper from a Chinese manufacturer published in brain stimulation last year. And the Percept from Medtronic was also released last year. And there's an Italian company called Neuronica that uh, released uh, Alpha DBS that uh, should also be able to apply ADBS in the near future. Well, this opens up um, two important avenues, um, or maybe more, but the, the, there will be new insights in the behavior of physiomarkers over long periods of time. And you can see what happens when uh, people behave uh, like they would like to behave um, uh, in their own home during walking, during talking, and um, during uh, yeah, a typical uh, a typical day. And this new technology enables us to record that for longer periods and to see how robust the signals are, and at which moments we might intervene with more efficacious stimulation strategies. And uh, by being able to, to record for uh, longer periods and closing the loop with stimulation, uh, there might become uh, clinical evidence or more robust real world evidence that, that ADBS might contribute to uh, the well being of patients. This was a press release by, uh, by Medtronic in, in January. It shows that the first uh, ADBS trial is, is about to start. So uh, there will be real world evidence about, uh, about ADBS in the near future. So this is going to be a first trial. Um, I don't think it's going to be the last trial because uh, as I showed you, there are tens of thousands of stimulation possibilities in, in DBS. So it's on forehand difficult to say whether the first adaptive uh, strategy is the best strategy or that these, uh, these adaptive strategies should adapt uh, themselves. But nevertheless, the, the, the technical possibilities of conducting these, uh, these studies are really uh, amazing. Um, with this in mind, uh, we started um, our own um, recordings with patients uh, with, uh, uh, with Percept batteries and were able to record for longer periods in a cohort of patients that uh, got battery replacements. So by uh, being able to connect to the Percept system, it becomes possible to record for, from several sources and to look um, how the data might be of use for um, uh, amplifying or adjusting the stimulation parameters and to see how the stimulation parameters um, influence the, uh, the physiomarkers. Um, this is a study from the Philip Starr group that was uh, um, in a preprint last year um, that shows that um, there are possibilities of uh, recording for, um, for over 150 hours in a small cohort of PD patients show that um, there is a correlation between um, wearables and, um, and LFP signals um, from the cortex and the subcortex, which shows the, uh, yeah, the huge potential of, of recording patients for, uh, for longer periods. Um, the same holds for Tremor. This is a very uh, recent paper from the Oxford group, uh, which shows that it's possible to, uh, to record um, Tremor in a cohort of, of Tremor patients. Uh, and by applying machine learning, um, it becomes possible to, um, to record um, Tremor and to differentiate that from uh, physiological movements. And by applying these more intelligent algorithms, uh, 
uh, instead of just a frequency band, which uh, seems to be more challenging in, in Charmer. Uh, we see two yeah, state-of-art developments, the, the application of brain-computer interface and uh, machine learning come together in potentially powerful um, resources for, uh, for patients. Um, this is one of the examples um, of our own patients where uh, we see that it's possible to, uh, to, to detect uh, beta peaks in the, uh, in the STM. We see that these peaks are still quite broad, but um, we, uh, we do seem to, to recognize the, the profile of oscillatory patterns um, um, in, uh, in these patients with, with chronically implanted devices um, when we compare it with uh, our cohorts of externalized patients. Um, furthermore, uh, we can see that it's possible to, uh, to see uh, diurnal fluctuations in patients where it's possible to, to see what the effect of DBS is when DBS is uh, switched on and off and what happens during day and what happens during night uh, in the different, uh, different hemispheres. So it's, um, this will be valuable information um, and you can imagine that a plethora of, of data will become available for, for patients. Um, furthermore, um, we can see differences um, uh, that are related to, to tasks. So it's possible to, 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 uh, to, to uh, program block designs and to do uh, psychophysical uh, recordings and to conduct motor paradigm to look at uh, differences um, in power spectral density related to uh, handedness and tasks, for example. Um, however, um, there are, are some serious concerns uh, with regard to the, to the data. Uh, we do see that um, um, a portion of the patients show uh, EKG artifacts and uh, we, uh, we see that in the literature as, as well. Um, this was released last month, um, where it's uh, especially um, the case that if the the, uh, the battery is placed in the left clavicle close to the heart, that um, these um, cardiac artifacts are especially uh, present, which um, makes it uh, more difficult to apply ADBS in, in those, uh, those patients. Um, so to wrap up, um, very recent DBS hardware developments will accelerate the exploration of subcortical terra incognita. Uh, a plethora of real data, world data will become available for each patient treated with DBS. And uh, that's an exciting new avenue for both research and care. Um, ADBS will become one of the first clinically applied great computer interfaces. Um, there are many um, advantages, but I think some cautions should be needed as well, because we're going to apply algorithms on, on the behavior of, of patients. And we know that there are uh, non-motor side effects of PBS, and I think we really should be cautious of that. To, um, to conclude, I would, would like to show you a very uh, old observation, which shows that adaptive DBAs was already applied in the 1960s in animal research, where the, the application of ADBS uh, led to um, severe um, neurobehavioral side effects. So we also know that the beta oscillations play a, an important role in, in behavior. So I think we, uh, we should proceed in this direction, but uh, should look after our care patients very carefully uh, in, uh, in the experiments we're going to, uh, to conduct. Uh, I'd like to conclude with uh, my acknowledgements, especially for, for Dan uh, Pina Fuentes, Artu Bayink, and Marielle Stam, with who I collaborate uh, in, in Amsterdam on the, on the latest recordings I uh, showed you, and uh, the DBS team of Amsterdam, and my uh, past and ongoing uh, collaborators. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great overview. I don't see many questions yet in the 